Jesus said he came to earth to save the lost. And that's the reason we're here on earth. Our only job, really, when you settle it down to everything that we Christians are supposed to do, we're supposed to put people into heaven. That's our assignment from the Lord Jesus Christ, putting people into heaven. But Jesus expressed one time while he was on earth, if you don't believe me when I tell you that I'm the Son of God, when I tell you that I'm the way and the truth and the life, when I tell you that if you'll believe in me, you can get to heaven. He said, if you won't believe me because of what I say, then believe me because of the works or miracles you see me do. And so we find that that's a basic principle that Jesus used and that we're to use. We're to go out and do miracles, great exploits, healing the sick, raising the dead, whatever needs to be done, we're to do all of these things so that people will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. That's our assignment. That's our function. Now, how did Jesus really heal the sick? Did you know that until Jesus was about 30 years old that he couldn't have healed a back problem? He couldn't have healed a wart? He couldn't have healed any of these things? He might have prayed at that time, but there's no record that he did uh, because he didn't have the power of God. And so once the Holy Spirit came on Jesus, remember when he was baptized, when he was 30 years old, he came up out of the water and the Holy Spirit came down on him in the shape or in the likeness of a dove. And Jesus was endued with the power of God. He went out into the wilderness uh, to be tempted of the devil. The devil came along and I'm sure he looked him right straight in the eye and said, if if you're the Son of God. He tried to tempt Jesus. That was his first thing. But Jesus even operated at that moment, right after the baptism, with one of the gifts of the Spirit. He discerned the devil. He caught the old fellow in the act. And uh, he just, in the name of Jesus, he just, I mean, he didn't say in the name of Jesus like we have to, but uh, he quoted scripture right back at him and said, you know, I am the Son of God. And he gave those scriptures, and he came back in the power of the Holy Spirit. The first thing he did, he, uh, he turned water into wine, which is a pretty neat little miracle, because uh, when we are born again, we're just natural, uh, the water. But when we're turned into the wine, we got the blood of Jesus, and we're born again. So he started off with a miracle that became a spiritual miracle, so that we, who are born of water, the third chapter of John, must be born again. We must be born of the Spirit of God, and that's the greatest first miracle that Jesus Christ wants to do in every life. He wants everybody to be born again, born of the Spirit, not just of the water. Hallelujah. So we get the stage set where Jesus is ready to assign us these functions. And then Jesus one day was walking through a, a crowd and a little old woman with an issue of blood touched the hem of his garment. And Jesus said something. It's a dynamic principle on healing. He said, I felt healing virtue the King James says, I felt healing power go out of me. What was this power? What was the power that healed? And so we find that it's the power of God's Holy Spirit. Now, in 1968, after I released everything in my life up to God, I just said, I just threw myself at God. Anything you want, God, I don't care. Anything you want to do in my life, here it is. Family didn't matter. Money didn't matter. My home didn't matter. My business didn't matter. Nothing mattered except, Jesus, you tell me what to do, and I'll do anything, anything you want me to do. And uh, during that process of God putting me under the Word of God, and I spent literally thousands of hours. Francis and I perhaps have uh, meditated as much as 18,000 hours apiece in the Word of God, seeing what we can do for Jesus, not what He can do for us, what we can do for God with our lives, what He can do. That's how He got rid of my nasty attitude. He said they're wrong, and I said, okay. I'll quit them. And that's, that's the thing. If you got a bad habit, if you smoke or drink or cuss or anything, uh, you, God will convict you. Well, just quit them because God will show you in his word that that's the way to do it. Well, during that process of time, God did mighty miracles in my life, just little quiet miracles, just personal miracles, uh, not so much healing, but just dynamic things in my own life. And, and one particular night, God I was lying on my back, looking up to God in perfect health, wide awake, and I saw this body lying up above me, just in the same position I was. It was just stretched out, and I was amazed. Here's a body floating up in air above me, and I'm thinking, God, that's my spirit. You've taken my spirit out, but I knew I wasn't sick, and I was, uh, I was wide awake, and I said, God, I'm looking at my spirit out of my body. As I looked at it, I said, God, same size of me. When I looked at the face, same face. Most handsome guy. I mean, it's, it's the same face. Hallelujah. Identical face, except all of this was like it was carved out of a thin fog or cloud. I could see through it, but clearly that was Charles, and I knew that was my spirit. God had shown me something that was very significant. Well, just one other little uh, 
piece of that testimony is that while I was looking at this, all of this thinking going on, and I'm looking at it, my sight is going on, and all of a sudden, all this thinking moved from my head into the head of that spirit body. And I realized God said, even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit. So God had taken my soul and joined my spirit. And there I was. And God then took me on up to heaven and back down in the spirit. But the part of that I wanted to share in relation to this healing, my spirit and your spirit is the same size that you are. And because of this, when Jesus comes into our heart, when we're born again, literally the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ fills our spirit up like a bottle from the bottom of our feet to the top of our head to the tips of our fingers. We're filled with the Lord Jesus Christ, His Spirit. And that's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's why in Romans 8 chapter said, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ in you, you're not a Christian. So we know from that that we're utterly and completely filled up with the Spirit of Jesus Christ. It is not I who live, but Christ. Christ who lives in me. Jesus literally living on earth today in and through each of us, filling us up with his spirit to do the works that Jesus did. But when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, the Bible speaks of being filled with the Holy Spirit, then your spirit, the same size as you, is completely and totally filled up with God's Holy Spirit. His spirit, the power of God, not just the power, but God himself living in us. That's why we're called the temple of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's why in the 17th chapter of John, and I love it in the living Bible, Jesus looked up to his father and said, Father, as I am in you and you are in me, let us go live in those people down on earth and let us do our job through them. And it's awesome to realize that we are where God in Christ Jesus lives. And it was this power of God that's in us that does everything. The Holy Spirit does everything. He convicts of sin. He does mighty works. But one of the things that he does is to give us the power to heal the sick, power to cast out devils. That's just one of the little uh, side lines of what he does, but it's a tool. At healing the sick is a tool. Casting out devils is a tool. When people fall under the power of God, it's a tool. It's a ministry. It's a miracle. It'll cause people to believe. And so when we realize that being filled with the Spirit of God, and that's a power that heals the sick, we're totally filled up, then it's simply a matter of how do you get the power of God out of the Spirit of God in you into a sick body to heal them. I'm going to say that again. The simple principle of healing the sick is how do you get the power of the Spirit of God, which is the healing power, out of God's Spirit in you into people's body to heal them. Now, in the case of medical science, we have a, a, a medication called penicillin, just as an example. Penicillin is a dynamic ministry, and we praise God for doctors, for medicine, what uh, God has given us on earth to, to just simply drive away a lot of these diseases. It'll hit us, uh, but we thank God more for the healing power. So we're working with doctors a lot and uh, medication if needed. But uh, when you uh, say there was an epidemic that hit your area of the world, and people were just dying like flies all over the place and he said oh if we had a shipment of penicillin we could stop all of this death we could stop all of this sickness if we just had the penicillin and here comes a big plane load of penicillin beautifully boxed up ready to be plunged into these people's body to heal them and and the doctors put it up on a shelf in this uh, pharmacy where they were located and they said oh wow now we've got penicillin now we can wipe out this uh, whole uh, plague that's hit this country and they sit and admire the penicillin. What happens? The people keep dying because penicillin in a bottle will not heal the sick. They must take it out of that bottle, put it in a little syringe needle, and jab it into your body, and then they must push that in so that it goes in your body. And once it's inside of your body, once they dispense this penicillin into your body, the penicillin can go to work and heal you. It'll kill those bugs that are in you, and it'll cause your body to be healed by the power of penicillin, really. Now, here we are, a body of Christ, every believer on earth, and Jesus speaking of every believer will heal the sick. Uh, every one of us filled with God's Holy Spirit, filled with this penicillin power of the Holy Spirit, utterly, completely, big a five foot 11 and three quarters inch bottle of Holy Ghost penicillin. That's me. You may not be that high or you may be taller than that, but your penicillin is just as powerful as mine. Now, uh, when we realize that for 2,000 years, except for a few people, we've sat here full of penicillin, plagues going on, people sick all over the world but they're not getting healed. We pray for them. We do all kinds of things trying to get them healed. We beg God. We plead with God. Oh, God, heal them. All kinds of things we've tried to do to get people healed. But we haven't learned to dispense 
the power of God's Holy Spirit into their body. How do you do this? How do you get this Holy Ghost penicillin out of the Spirit of God in you into their bodies? And that's the basis of a major part of our teaching on how you can heal the sick, how each person, every believer will heal the sick. And it's very interesting that we haven't known that, and so we've sat around like, uh, like bottles of penicillin, Holy Ghost power in believers all over the world, and very few people get, uh, get healed. Most people uh, pray for the sick. And, of course, God is sovereign. And because of your sincerity, God will sometimes heal that way. Francis and I had a very, very great percentage heal. Out of 10,000, we maybe got 10 healed without the power of the Holy Spirit. It just didn't work. We were praying. I mean, we had some of the most beautiful prayers you could ever imagine. Some of them took 30 minutes to pray. Hallelujah. The only problem is nobody got healed. Just a few healings. But when they did get healed, we told everybody. Sometimes we'd talk a month about one healing healing because it was great a healing God healed a God did a supernatural thing but we said God your word says and Jesus you said in your word that every single believer and we, we read it at every day you're going to go around in your daily walk of life you're going to go around healing the sick you're casting out devils you're going to minister the baptism you're going to minister salvation all of us doing that every day in a normal walk of life Jesus it's not happening why isn't it and so Jesus began to teach us by the Spirit of God little things about how to dispense this power of God into people's body to get them healed. Doesn't that sound human? Isn't that neat? Just dispensing God's Holy Ghost power. You are unlimited. I mean, it's not like you run out of a bottle of penicillin and have to go hunt for more. You're forever living waters, living waters, springs of living water, wells, rivers of living water, ready to be dispensed out into people's bodies to heal them. That's simple. Everything in healing is very, very simple if you'll always move back to that same principle. It's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It is not I who heal, but the power of God that's in me heals. And how do you release that? One of the triggers that you release it like a bullet out of a gun. When you pull that trigger, it releases that bu uh, bullet. When a, uh, when a hammer comes down and ignites that uh, powder that's in there and that sends that bullet out, the same thing happens when we say, in the name of Jesus, or by the authority of Jesus Christ, be healed. Backs be healed. Devils, you come out. In the name of Jesus. That means simply the authority, as Francis explained earlier. That's the authority Jesus has placed in us, but he's placed a tremendous responsibility on each one of us. Do we, the body of Christ, and wherever in the world you're listening to this or watching this video, wherever you are, you have the absolute total responsibility for the souls of mankind and for the proof to them by miracles that Jesus Christ is alive today. That's our responsibility. Responsibility. If we don't do it, God can't, Jesus can't, the Holy Spirit can't. He designed it so that the people would be the witnesses. Every one of us are the ones that preach the gospel. Every single one of us are the ones that cast out devils. We're the ones that heal the sick. We're the ones that uh, minister the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're the ones that speak in tongues. We're the ones who uh, bind the old devil. We say we got power over that snake and nothing can hurt us. And we can bind the devil, cast him out, free people from the bondage of Satan. That's our job. That's our responsibility. That's your responsibility. And Jesus doesn't have anybody but us. There is nobody but us. But Jesus said, the harvest is so great and mighty and ready and white, but the laborers are few. The laborers are not many, he said. And so Jesus was having to go out there and minister alone to sometimes 15 or 20,000 probably because he fed 5,000 men plus women and children, great audiences. And he spoke to these, and he had to do all that healing by himself. Now, I'm sure he found a lot of ways to minister in groups and masses to get people healed, or else he would not have had enough time in three and a half years to probably even heal just two or three audiences. But Jesus took that on himself. But he designed it so that he could transplant himself, his spirit, into every one of us and give us all the power that he held, all power that God had given him. Now it resides in his people, and we, the people, are to go out and do this work. And so since he said that the laborers are few, then as a businessman, and I'm a retired certified public accountant, I'm a retired captain in the United States Air Force, a uh, businessman, Frances owned a big printing company, and uh, she gave that away when God told her to, and then she retired and married me. And that makes her retired too, hallelujah. Uh, I'm a lifetime member of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship, and God's doing a mighty work uh, in the Full Gospel Businessmen uh, worldwide in their families and the people they minister to. 
Well, when we realize, he said, go into all the world, and yet I don't have enough laborers. I can picture Jesus uh, going down to the Jerusalem newspaper. Hallelujah. And he's going up to him and said, hey, I'd like to put an ad in your newspaper, and I would like it to run from now until the time I come back to earth. And he said, I'd like for you to print it in red with a little bit of a heading on it, and let's make a one-column ad. Let's make it about two and a half inches tall, and we'll take that ad, maybe a, maybe a two-by-three-inch ad. And he said in here, help on it. People who know how to heal the sick, people who know how to lead people to Jesus, people who know how to minister the baptism, people who know how to heal the sick. I need help. And so I want anybody that will apply that's got that qualification, I'll hire you. Even if it's 11th hour, I'll give you full pay. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter when he hires us, but as soon as he can get us in, then we start producing fruit for him. And so this little ad, he just simply went on, like it says in the last chapter of Mark there, and many other places in the Bible, if you want to tear that piece out, this plenty of places you can find it in the Bible. And he just simply said, now, all you believers, I want you, he could have said, I want you to learn how to lead people to Jesus. I want you to learn how to minister the baptism. I want you to learn how to cast out devils. I want you to learn how to bind that old serpent, the devil, and all of his poisons and get rid of them. And I want you, all of you, to know how to heal the sick. And as soon as you know and get qualified, come in and I'll give you a job. And I'll pay you well. I'll give you a hundredfold return on anything you give up to follow me, and I'll give you eternal life on the side as a bonus, a retirement plan. Hallelujah. See, that's our Lord Jesus Christ giving us full blaze, but full authority, all power. And he said, nothing will hurt us. And we got all power over all these enemies of sickness and devils. And then he turned the job over to us. And he went up to heaven and said, here it is, folks. You go do it. And so we find the example in the beginning church of a few little people, a fisherman, a tax collector, a very highly educated Paul, and, uh, and some women were involved in it. Jesus' mother were involved in it. And on the day of Pentecost, it was like a wind, like a rushing mighty wind. And and they were waiting for what Jesus had promised. When I go up, I'm going to send back the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, ordinary people, you're going to receive power and you're going to be my witnesses and you're going to go out and do my work and you're going to have signs and wonders following. And on that day of Pentecost, when that glorious day came, they all began to speak with other tongues and the glory of God came down and two mighty things happened. Not only did they receive this endowment of power, there was a glorious thing, but they got also another dynamic thing that is going to come upon this earth all over the earth very quickly. You'll see it very, very soon, and that's prophetic, and it's from the Word of God. Uh, John said, I baptize you with water, but Jesus is going to come, and He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Something we've overlooked a lot is that Jesus is coming back for a holy bride without spot or wrinkle or blemish. And Jesus said, only the holy will see God. And because He's saying that, Jesus cannot come down for the bride of Christ with sin in their life, with bad attitudes and bad habits, and uh, uh, not going out and doing the works of Jesus. That's as big a sin as any of not performing the works Jesus said, because the whole world is hungry and they're ready to go. Jesus even went so far as to say, every creature on this earth is going to hear the gospel with signs and wonders following as ordinary believers go out and do this. Every one of them, today five billion people plus, he said every one of them are going to hear the gospel when you folks get out there. And so the disobedience of not doing, not so much disobedience, it's just not knowing how, but now the body of Christ is learning. And so suddenly uh, the harvesters are becoming more numerous. Thousands and thousands are learning how to heal the sick. Thousands and thousands are learning how to witness and be a powerful witness and do this great work work of Jesus. And then he said, when the gospel is preached to all the world, I'll be back. And it's not going to be long, is it, before the Lord Jesus Christ returns. I hope none of you are watching this video when we go up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, the simple power of distributing and dispersing, dispensing the power of God's Holy Spirit to heal the sick is a mighty weapon. Jesus healed the sick so that they would believe. It's a tool. It's not an end in itself. Jesus didn't come to save, the, to heal the sick. He came to save the lost. So the end must always be whenever you minister, whoever you minister to around the world, you must always keep foremost in your mind. Make sure that they know Jesus and then make sure that they become baptized with the Holy Ghost and learn how to 
administer these supernatural powers because Jesus said, go and make disciples. And that's the multiplication process that we have, dispensing the power of God. Now, let me share you just a little bit more on how you can understand uh, the Holy Spirit within you, uh, the power of God that heals, and many other things, of course, we're dealing with healing right now. Uh, I want everyone, wherever you might be, if you're in a room that's got a light bulb or just picture it in your own imagination, I want you to look at a light. And you'll notice that in this particular room, the lights are on. That's a great expression, a very intellectual statement. The lights are on. Hallelujah. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. And so we got to have our lights on all the time. Now, when Francis and I began to work into where we believe Jesus wanted us to see that we learn how to heal the sick, like Jesus said, and learn how we were to teach others and equip them to do the same thing, then we begin to think. We begin to use common sense. Well, why does it work or why doesn't it work? Why can we get some healed and then none, none healed at other times and a lot healed at other times? Why will one disease suddenly start being healed on a fairly consistent basis after we got the baptism and started really in, uh, in start, in initially using that power? Uh, see, with the power, you're still learning to dispense it. Well, we didn't know how at first, and it didn't happen very much at first. But we did get a lot more people healed the first month and the second month a lot more and the third month a lot more. And now now today we're seeing possibly 80% of the people as we touch them healed by the power of God and then it won't be long until they'll all be healed. How many did Jesus heal? When they came to him, remember that. He didn't go around and just heal uh, people that are walking down on the street. Uh, he healed the people that God's Holy Spirit brought to him. Now you'll find in every day in your life God will put you in touch with somebody that's looking for Jesus. And he said if, if you'll call on my name he said I'll find you, you'll find me and so we're to watch for those opportunities and so as this, as this began to happen we learned uh, how to really release this power. Then we discovered that learning more about different ways to dispense came into being and we were able to not only minister healing but train others to heal hallelujah now we're talking right now uh, about how to lay hands on a sick and heal them why did that work clay laid upon clay will not heal clay and our bodies are clay so why was it that Jesus said lay hands on the sick and they'll get well the living Bible said lay hands on the sick and heal them why does this work well as you look at these light bulbs you'll see that they're on they're shining they're bright but French and I reasoned back of this with common sense and said well you know if the lights are on I knew enough in science from school that uh, there was a power plant a generator that generated electricity and when that electricity was generated uh, they designed a way for it to flow through little wires that ultimately reached the filament of a light bulb and it illuminated those uh, those filaments and they they shine and so we began to have lights and we could we could turn on our lights and turn them off anytime we wanted to we found a control for that and so we found out that there's a thing very very high, highly technical thing called a light switch have any of you ever turned a light switch on or off hallelujah well if you have you can heal the sick that's how simple it is but why why does that light switch fit into this thing of the light shining or not shining because the energy that flows from that source of power flows up to its destination and it's through this wire and we can do something with a breaker or light switch and we pull it apart when we turn it off and the light the energy cannot flow so the lights go out but when we turn it on it pulls those two little wires together again the energy can flow from its source up to its destination and heal the sick inside of each of us is a power plant a very powerful power plant the spirit of the living God the healing power of God is inside of us but we have to get it out into other people's bodies so we lay hands on them we become that little light switch and when we put our hand upon them wherever they might be sick then and that connects the flow of the energy of God from within us into their body. Isn't that simple? You lay hands on somebody's head. If they've got a headache, you lay hands on their elbow. If they've got an elbow problem, you, uh, Francis even puts her feet on people's feet. Did you ever hear that scripture, lay feet on the sick and they'll get healed? 
Well, it's not in the Bible that way, but uh, but it's a very convenient way if you don't want to bend over and they got like seed warts on their feet. Put your foot on there and say, in Jesus' name, I curse you, seed warts, and let the power go out through your foot. It's the same kind of a light switch. It's just a connecting point. And when that energy of God flows through your hand and goes into their body, it's God's power that heals. And that's the simple way to see what you do when you lay hands on the sick and heal them. You see? You lay hands and release the power of God, but if you don't lay hands, what's going to happen? Except by sovereign acts of God that he does sometimes, they don't get healed. That's why we've got a sick world. That's why so many people are sick, because the body of Christ sit there with all this power and don't even know how to make a light switch out of themselves. Now you know, so there's no other excuse in all the world than to go out and just use this light switch, turn that power into them, and send it into their bodies, and they will be healed. Thank you, Jesus. Francis will come and share a little bit. And uh, we got so much in this, this area that's so vital to you that we want you to have so ingrained in you this principle of dispensing God's power to heal the sick. And you do it, not Jesus, not God, not the Holy Spirit, but you're the dispenser of that. You're the doctor. You're the nurse. You're the, the light switch. And when we do our part, God's always there to do completely his part. And when we get enough confidence that that light will go on when we turn the light switch on, then we'll have confidence so that all will be healed through us. Because Jesus said he healed them all many, many times. And he said, all those things that I've done, you're going to do too. And you'll do even greater things. So it's exciting. Hallelujah. There are a few things to remember when you start laying hands on the sick. Now, how many of you have already in your life laid hands on the sick? I assume that all of you here probably have, or most of you have. How many of you have not yet seen the degree of success that you want to see when you lay hands on the sick? All right, that's the reason that you're here, because you want to learn how to do better than you're doing. One of the things to remember is that healing is simple. We try and complicate healing. We try and make it difficult. We make everything difficult. How many of you know that? We make salvation difficult. We make the baptism with the Holy Spirit difficult. When I think of all the people who have tarried for years to receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit just because nobody told them to open their mouth. You know, and you can't receive the baptism when you got your mouth shut, amen? And yet, you see, nobody, everybody was afraid to tell them how to do it. Oh, it's a sovereign act of God. Yes, it is a sovereign act of God. God's Holy Spirit takes the sound of your voice and makes a language out of it. And in all healing, you must remember that God is sovereign. In spite of what we teach you, in spite of all of the things that we have learned, remember that God is still sovereign. He can do it any way that he wants to do it. But we've learned a lot of things that will really help. And one of the things that we've remembered is to keep it simple. When you try and complicate healing, you get absolutely nowhere. Now, let me show you a very, very good example of that. Charles and I... Uh, right after we got the baptism, and I mean right after we got the baptism with the Holy Spirit, we were in a church, and we were, uh, no, we weren't in a church, we were in a building, uh, uh, like a school auditorium, and we were going to lay hands on the sick. And the first one that we laid, we saw, was a man in a wheelchair. Now, we believe what God's Word says, those who believe shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And so we were going to make it complicated. We stood over that man. We must have prayed for him a half an hour. And I mean, we prayed. We were so fervent in our praying, and we were so loud in our praying. And then every once in a while, we'd break out in tongues, didn't we, Charles? I mean to tell you, we had the fanciest prayer, and we had, must have had 35, 40, 50 people around us, and they were just praying in tongues too. And then Charles and I did the final thing. We drugged that man out of the wheelchair. He must have weighed 350 pounds. He was a great big man. When I tell you he was great big, I mean he was great big. So we drug him out of the wheelchair and then I almost broke my back getting him back into the wheelchair. 
And we discovered, we decided that that was the first one and the last one that we would ever drag out of a wheelchair. Because if they're not touched, if somehow or another that connection is not made when you touch them, all the dragging them out of the wheelchair in the world will not work. All you'll have to do is to put them back into the wheelchair again. Now, we were trying to do it so hard. I mean, here we are, we're just praying up a storm, but Jesus didn't say that, did he? He said, those who believe shall lay hands on them. And you are that light switch. When you touch and that light switch connects and the bulb isn't burned out, that person is going to be healed just like that. You know what we also need to remember, not only to keep it simple, and as I was sitting over there listening to Charles, and I was thinking about keeping it simple, I thought, you know, so many people have said to me, how do you maintain a healing? And we're going to spend a little time later on telling you how to maintain a healing. Maintaining it is just as simple as receiving a healing. And so many people, when they want to receive a healing, they also get up tight. How many of you ever somebody, oh, please, God, 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 heal me. I never see those tense people get healed. You know, healing is so simple. If you believe that God wants you healed, and you believe that it's scriptural to be healed, and that's one of the things that you have to be convinced of. How many of you are convinced that it is God's will to heal? How many of you really believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Yes, if he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, if he healed yesterday, he's going to heal today. And if we can only look at the way he did it in the Bible, it is so simple. Let me just show you something with the laying on of hands. Open your Bibles to the 8th chapter of Matthew, if you will, please. And Charles, would you bring your chair up here just a little bit closer? I want to show you a principle that I hope you will never forget where healing is concerned. And then, as soon as we finish this teaching, we're going to let some of you lay hands on the sick. We're going to let you be a light switch for somebody else. Now, in the 8th chapter of Matthew, and I'm reading from the New King James, it said, when Jesus had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Okay, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying... Now, I want you to notice the first thing the leper did. What was the first thing he did? He worshipped him. He worshipped him. That's why we always have great praise and worship before our services. That's why we had praise and worship in here today. Because praise, I heard somebody in this area say, praise is the plow that makes the furrow in your heart to open up your heart to receive what God has got for you. Amen? See, that's why praise and worship is so vital and so important. It's also vital and important that you enter into it. Every once in a while, I see a service, and I see somebody just sitting there, not raising their hands, not singing, just looking around. And, and this is obviously what they're thinking. I wish they'd get this mess over with so I could get healed and get out of here. Now, whenever I see somebody like that, I say, Lord, deliver me. I don't want to lay hands on them because they never get healed. They never get healed. You need to get into that praise and that worship of God and that adoration of God to really be able to see or to pre prepare yourself to receive a healing because it is so simple. Get your mind off of yourself, as Charles says, and get it on God. So many people think about themselves, and all they think about is, I want to be healed, I want to be healed, I want to be healed, I want to be healed. That's understandable when you're sick. How many of you have ever been sick? And I rebuke a spirit of lying that says you haven't been sick. All right. All right. Now, you see, when you are sick, you want to be healed. And it's hard to get your mind off of yourself. But if you can put it out on God, you just open up that pipeline for the power of God to come in and to be healed. That's why praise and worship is so fantastic. But then keep it simple. The leper came and he worshipped him. That was step number one. And that is a smart thing to do. Now, the second thing he said, and I want you to notice that even the leper made it simple. He did not say, 
I have written down a list of 97 diseases that I have. The doctor says I have the worst case of this of anybody that they have ever seen. They have never seen anybody who have, has arthritis as bad as I do. I have TMJ. I have a headache. I have this. I have that. I have this. I have that. They don't concentrate on anything. All they're interested in doing is talking to you. Did you ever notice that? If you get somebody like that, I mean, that's all right. If they need to talk, let them talk it out. But that's not what's going to get them healed. What's going to get them healed is when they put their eyes on God and then they are open to receiving the healing power of God. You see, as long as you're talking and you're griping about what's wrong with you, how many of you know you can't give and transmit at the same time? So you see, you're giving out all this information. I mean, I got all this wrong with me. I got all this wrong with me. And you're not, you're not capable of then receiving what God has. So the leper, I love him. He made it very simple. He said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, here is where we run into a problem. Because this is what a lot of people think that Jesus did. They think he immediately had a Pentecostal fit. And he began to shake and he began to quake all over the place. Can I tell you that shaking does not heal the sick? How many of you know that? Shaking does not heal the sick. A Pentecostal massage does not heal the sick either. It doesn't. Yelling doesn't heal the sick. It's the power of God. It's the name of Jesus that does the trick. But a lot of people think that Jesus immediately had a Pentecostal fit, began to lay on the floor, roll and kick and holler all over the place, and then they think he probably looked up, and I want you to think how many times you've heard what I'm going to say to you. Oh, God. Oh, God. Look at this great saint of God. Did you ever hear him pray and tell God what a great saint the person was they were praying for? How many of you believe that God knows whether he's a dirty, nasty sinner or a great saint of God? Don't con God. That comes out of the heading of conning God when you say, oh God, this man is such a saint. Look at him. He used to be the church treasure. He's taught Sunday school. He sang in the choir. He was the head usher. He was everything. Oh God, you know what a great man he is. You do not have to tell God what a great person he is. I guarantee you God knows everything about his dirty nasty heart. Amen. He doesn't have one. He doesn't have one. He has a clean heart. But uh, you see, God knows the part of the person that you're talking about. Then we go on from here. This is we say, oh God, he's got leprosy. <gasps> oh God, and you know how awful that is? I can just imagine Jesus doing this. <gasps> Look, God, he's got no feet. The leprosy's eating them all off. No hands, God. <gasps> no ears. No nose. Nothing left. No hair. <laughs> Did leprosy cause that, Charles? Can't you see Jesus say, oh, God, oh, God, look at him, look at him, look at him, look at him. How many of you believe God knows exactly what that man looks like? How many of you believe that God knows whether he's got feet, hands, legs or not? You don't have to go through all that. Ra see, that's what I call making it complicated to heal the sick. Do you know what you're doing? You're whipping up a lot of sympathy for this man, and he's, getting, he's just feeling so sorry for himself, and he's just thinking, no hands, no feet, no nothing, you know, absolutely nothing. And so this poor man is thinking about what? Instead of? Or you see how he's keely? What? Sympathy kills. Compassion heals. I've seen so many people, and bless their hearts, who are so sympathetic to the sick. But beloved, sympathy kills. Sympathy kills because sympathy makes them look inward at themselves. You need to get them thinking outward so that their eyes are on God. And then they, they, then they get down at the bottom and they think Jesus was probably saying, Oh, gee, God, please. Oh, please. Oh, please. Oh, please. Oh, please, God, heal him. Did you ever hear anybody say that? I see, we think that's real spiritual to say that. But we need to do it like Jesus did. He did none of the things that I just said to you. I want you to, if I can read the word of God, Jesus kept it simple. And this is what it says. Jesus reached out his hand. And what did he do? Touched him. 
Did it say he left his hand on him for an hour? What did it say he did? He touched him. And he said five words. He kept it simple. He said, I am willing be cleansed. Five words. I am willing be cleansed. And what happened to the man? Instantly, immediately, he was healed. Now, did you see how simple Jesus made that? That's why I think is one of the greatest references in the Bible to just show you the simplicity of healing. Jesus did not go through most of the rigmarole that we go through. Do you know why most people go through a lot of rigmarole? To cover up their doubt and unbelief and their lack of faith. Did you know that? It is. That's why most people make this big rigmarole and they make a lot of noise and they make a lot of sound and so forth and so on. Do you know what I did the other night the minute that deaf boy was healed? I left him. I thought, let him rejoice by himself. I went right on. I tell you, when the, what do you think happened to the faith of the other people who were at that meeting? When they saw that deaf mute heal, their faith was so high. I wasn't going to stand with him and hoop and holler for 30 minutes. I mean, he was doing all right by himself with mama and grandma. And they're all crying all over the place. And I mean, I went right on to those next people just like that, right down the line. Because the faith was so high that I knew that it would be easy for them to be healed. But if I can impress you with anything, I I want to impress you with the fact that it is God's will that you be healed. Beloved, I wish above all things, above everything else, that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. God wants you healthy. God wants you wealthy. And the best way I know of to get in that position is to let your soul prosper all over the place. Then you will be healthy, wealthy, and wise. And I used to think that that was a secular expression, but that's not that totally. That's totally scriptural that Jesus wants you healthy, wealthy, and wise. Am I right in that? Yes. All right. Now, then I want you to remember that in healing, it is not all these little extra things that you put in. It's the power of God, and it's the name of Jesus that does it. I have seen less effect among people who, who to spend 30 minutes. If Charles and I spent 30 minutes over people, we wouldn't have time to do anything else. But we've discovered it's the power of God and it's the name of Jesus that takes care of and does that healing for you. I want to demonstrate a little more about this power that flows out of you. How many of you have ever read the story of Peter and how as he walked along people got into his shadow they got healed did you know that shadows heal the sick well they don't not even your body can heal the sick much less the shadow that your body extends out but the power of God not only will flow through your hands it flows out of all the parts of your body and it'll flow into people from wherever you are. We discovered that when one time we were uh, ministering along a prayer line, a healing line, and there was an altar bench between us and the people and we had to reach way out. And uh, when we did, uh, you know, some of them were getting healed, but none of them were falling over under the power of God. And we came to the end of that uh, bench and we walked up close to them and they all started falling under the power of God. And we realized that this energy, this uh, a force field of power flows out of all of the Spirit of God in all of you, whether it's your feet or your head or your fingers or what. God just uses hands as tools uh, to demonstrate the use of this, and we do use our hands tremendously for that. Well, when we realized that, we realized what was happening. Uh, the people were drawing this power out of Peter so much. They had so much belief that if this man could, if they could even get close to him, they'd get healed. And so when they got close enough to be at the end of his shadow, and I don't know whether it was uh, noontime or whether it was late in the afternoon. I got a feeling it was late in the afternoon. There were long distance out because there were a lot of people out. They just walked in a shadow and they got healed. And then we began to realize that this power will not only go just to the extent of your hands or your feet or whatever you lay, like Francis one time brushed up against a deaf man. She's walking by on the way to get a drink of water and her elbow touched him and his ears popped open. Just to, you know, lay elbows on people and they get healed in their ears. Hallelujah. See, it's the power of God that heals. And very simply now, I want to show you how, how this power radiates out beyond you. And I'd like to have the most fanatical lover of Jesus in this room to jump up real quick and come up here. Okay, come here. Now, I'd like also to have what we call in the spirit-filled world, coming right on up, a catcher. And cameras, you'll have to pull back. Uh, we got a, 
a medical doctor going to be the catcher. Isn't that neat? Now, I want to. I don't want to get too far out of this light because uh, I want the cameras to pull back so that they can catch this scene. Now, the energy of God flowing out of Peter is the same energy of God that's in me. The same energy that was in Jesus, and that's God's Holy Spirit power, is in him. Now, I'm going to start moving a little closer to her and you'll see I don't even have to get to her for the energy of God to go into her and the same energy that caused people to fall into the power is the energy that heals the sick. Now I want you to just see this mighty energy of God. Thank you Jesus. And ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you. See, there's a force field of energy goes out beyond you into people's body. That's what heals the sick. That's the power of God. And believe me, while we're on the subject just for a moment on falling under the power of God, uh, this is a phenomena. It's a sign and a wonder. It's not one of those that are listed uh, in the, 14th, the 16th chapter of Mark, but it's a sign and a wonder. Our healing teams that we train and go in these great arenas around the world, and they're out doing the healing. The testimonies that come back that thrill them the most. I laid hands and they fell under the power of God. The reason for that is it's a sign and a wonder. They know that God's energy is flowing out, and that energy not only will heal a body, it'll heal a mind. It'll drive out devils. It'll reach into the very souls of mankind and uh, those inner attitudes will be healed. People start wanting to read the Bible just because of the power of God. Now when I told you about my spirit and then finally my soul going out, I believe, and you don't have to believe this if you don't want to, I believe that your soul is in your head area and it is to your spirit body like your mind is to your physical body. You can take it or leave it as far as that, but that's the way I'm impressed from the trip I made up to heaven. But when you realize that, uh, then when we get through ministering healing, and sometimes when we're ministering healing, we very gently lay hands on people's heads, just a connection point to let the Spirit of God flow in, and we just say, Jesus, bless them. And you remember when Jesus, uh, one time he breathed the Holy Spirit upon the disciples? Personally, I believe that what Jesus did, he laid hands on their heads, and the energy of God, the breath of God, the wind of the Holy Spirit, God breathed from the Spirit of God in him into their very souls, and we've seen more uh, supernatural healings beyond the physical healing in people's lives. Salvation comes. Uh, they get turned on to Jesus. They get a boldness come into their lives when you lay hands. That's the reason the anointing was so powerful, was when you lay hands on people's heads, the energy goes into heads, but if they happen to have a toe ache, you don't lay hands on the head. You let that power go into that part of the body where they need healing and let it go in directly with the mightiest force that they can have. Hallelujah. I really believe that we're living in the days and times when we're going to become aware of what's on the inside of us. The same resurrection power that brought Jesus out of the grave is what you have when you have the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is a, there's only one Holy Spirit. Amen. Only one. So the same spirit that brought Jesus out of the grave is the same spirit that indwells you once you have the baptism with the Holy Spirit. I believe that we have not taken advantage of what God has given to us. Amen. And we need to go out. We need to realize what that power potential is, what that power plant is that is on the inside of us. Because all of us in here have enough power on the inside of us to literally explode the earth. And I believe the day is coming when you ladies that live in this area can go over into the Bullock department store or J.W. Robinson, whatever that is over there, you can walk down through those, through those uh, aisles and you're going to see the sales clerks fall out under the power of God because the power of God is going to be radiating from our bodies so strong. I believe that when you gentlemen go into a restaurant, I believe that, that the waiter is going to fall out under the power of God. I believe that we're living in the most supernatural days that Christians have ever had the opportunity to be alive. And when we begin to walk in that supernatural of God and we begin to believe that God's word is true, I believe we're going to see the supernatural like we have never seen it in all of our life. Now I want to show you something else because at this particular moment I'm going to ask if there is anybody who has pain in say any of your organs. Now I don't mean a back pain or that type of pain at this particular moment because I want to do something else. Somebody has, does somebody have pain in their body? What do you have? You have problems sitting. Well now that would probably be a, a spinal or a tailbone. You've had, 
All right. No, you're not what I'm looking for right now. I'll take you in the next one, okay? But I want somebody. Does is there somebody uh, who has a, a pain of some kind? Somebody's pointing to that lady right there, Charles Aguad, and question her. The reason that I want I want to show you what happens when you lay hands on, when you send the power of God into that other person's body. Is that girl here who had ulcerative colitis that I just laid hands on a few minutes ago when we came in? All right. Did you have pain when I laid hands on you? You had the surgery. All right. I want what I want. I want some. Then I'll t I'll do a simple one. Give me somebody who has a headache. Now that's so simple. All right. What kind of pain do you have? All right. Come here. All right. Give me somebody also who has a headache. What I'm trying to find out. Two of you can come up. That's okay. You see what I what I want to show you is what happens when you lay hands on the sick. He has pain in the prostate area. Okay, you've had it for years. Well, I think that's too long. How many think that's too long? All right. Now, what I want you to do, and let me give you this as good instructions. Ladies, do not lay your hands on the private parts of men. Men, do not lay your hands on the private part of women. Amen? All right, what you do, you see now if Charles were here, Charles could lay his hands and that would be all right. All right, but... What I do, I say, will you lay your hands on the area of the prostate gland? Is your prostate gland in the back, Doc? Does, it, does the prostate gland glow in the back? All right, and it could hurt the back. Okay, all right. So I would say to him, you lay your hands in the prostate area, and then I would lay my hands on top of him. Now, since I have a gentleman here, I'll let Charles lay hands on him. All right. Could we have a, a catcher up here, please? And if there's anybody in the world who knows about catchers, should be full gospel businessmen. Yes. Okay. Now, you wanted to demonstrate this uh, by uh, pain, but in what way? Do you want just laying on of hands? Just laying on of hands. That's what we're teaching in this particular hour. So you put your hands there. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to lay hands on him. Now, uh, we'll be sharing a little more about how normally you command things, but think, since this is simply laying on of hands, I'm going to put my hand on your hand, and I'm going to, like pulling a trigger, I'm going to release the power of God in there. And Jesus said, when we do that, you'll get healed. And so, three years of pain, and I'm expecting to be gone. So here it goes. In Jesus' name. That's the energy of God flowing out of the Spirit of God in me, in you, in Jesus, in the disciples. Hallelujah. Now just move around a little bit. Come on over. It's gone. No pain. Give Jesus a praise offering. Hallelujah. All right. Now, now what was this other pain here? We had a headache. We had a headache when I become... Let me, let me just show you that. Did you see how fast that pain up? Did you notice we didn't pray? Did you notice that? What do we do? Commanded. We, he commanded that pain to go in Jesus' name. Jesus said, those who believe shall lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. So what do you do? You lay hands on them. Did you notice how fast that was? Did you notice the first thing I said to him? I said, what happened to the pain? It's gone. Well, you see, I expect it to be gone. I didn't expect you to tell me it was still there because the Word of God works. How many of you believe it? And so we need to, to, when we lay hands on people, lay hands on them and expect God's power to work. This one has a good headache. Both have a sinus headache, okay? We're going to do something. Well, not allowed to. We just want to show about laying on of hands, okay? I'm just going to lay hands on her head. And I'm sending the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ into this head. In Jesus' name, I speak total healing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. What happened to your headache, honey? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, let's get him over on this side. All right, now. Uh, he's got a sinus headache, too, and it's up in this area. Okay. Now, again, uh, we're just teaching you 
uh, what it means to lay hands, how you're really releasing the power of God uh, into people's bodies. So uh, now Frances, you know, she laid hands in a big area of the head. That's fine. Uh, the only reason I don't like to do that too much, and she doesn't do it all the time, is people think you're giving them Pentecostal massage and pushing them over. Uh, but uh, simply to get rid of that sinus headache, I'm just going to rebuke it in Jesus' name. And see, laying hands on the sick to be healed. I'm just letting the power of God go right out of there in Jesus' name. Now go, paint. Now try it. Shake your head around. It's gone. It's gone in Jesus' name. Simply laying hands on the sick. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, again, did you notice how simple it was? What, what power did he use? Now, what power? God's Holy Spirit. What name? Jesus. Remember, that's all it takes to do a miracle is the power of God's Holy Spirit and the name of Jesus. And it's so simple. How many of you are, going, are getting to be convinced that it actually is simple to heal the sick? You're really getting convinced of that? Great. Because, you see, if we can keep it simple, just like Jesus did when he said, I'm willing to be healed, if we can just keep it that simple, then it will be easy for us to go and to lay hands on the sick. Now, let me also tell you something, that your attitude has a lot to do with it. I have seen people walk up, they think, I don't think they're going to get healed. <laughs> they don't get healed. When I lay hands on you, I expect you to be healed. How many of you can tell when I lay hands on the sick, I expect them to be healed? How many of you can tell when Charles lays hands on them, he expects them to be healed? Uh, in the next hour, we're going to show you something that each and every one of you can be doing on a daily basis. Not only just laying hands on the sick, but laying hands plus. All right? I want you to give Jesus a big hand right now because you've learned that healing is simple. Okay.